This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 220, and this is a pretty um, pretty fun ride of an episode with two guests. We have Jonathan Burke and Jules Van Binsberg and join us, and this was one, I think it's fair to say, Ben Spicy conversation with two academics that have done a ton of research and are not afraid to speak their minds. Yeah, th- th- this is this is one of the episodes where you realize how little you actually know about financial markets. Um, I mean, we, during this conversation, overturned so many things that most listeners will have taken for granted in the way that they think about how markets work. Uh, so I... I, and, and that's, that's amazing. I mean, that's the, that's the best kind of episode. Yeah. We, we were just talking, Cameron, about how our favorite episodes are the ones that, that fundamentally change the way that you see the world. And I'm fairly certain that this episode will do that for most of our listeners. And I'm pretty sure listeners are going to say, oh, I wish you'd ask them this or ask them that as a follow-up. We were time constrained. We had a list we wanted to get through. So we did our best, but boy, there's a lot of, a lot of things that will, um, what do we say kind of through a grenade down your belief system? Yeah. But, uh, it's quite something. Yeah. We, we, we spent most of our conversation talking about their, I mean, I, I guess the whole conversation really talking about uh, their work on the relationship between manager skill and fund performance. Now I said the relationship, the reality is there is no relationship, which is, <laughs> which is kind of the basis of their research. Uh, people may remember that Fama told us that the best evidence of uh, efficient markets, when he was on our podcast, that the best evidence for efficient capital markets is that active management is a negative sum game. This conversation completely turns that on its head, and you'll hear Jonathan uh, directly disagree with with Fama, which, I mean, in terms of the way that people think about financial markets, that's about as fundamental as it gets. <laughs> So Jonathan is a professor of finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business, co-authored two very popular textbooks on corporate finance and fundamentals in finance. He was the associate editor of the Journal of Finance from 2000 to 2008, has a PhD from Yale, and is originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. And then Jules is a professor of finance at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and has a PhD from Duke. And if you're interested, you can listen to their podcast called All Else Equal, Making Better Decisions. So it's shorter episodes, about 30-minute episodes. Really good, really well done. Yeah, well, they have episodes with people like John Cochran, Cliff yep. Asnes, other people that we've had on, on our podcast. It's, it's very different from, from our podcast, but it's, if, you, if you're a finance nerd, it's, uh, it, it's definitely a good listen. They, they have uh, a very good dynamic between the two of them. And that comes out in this conversation as well. We, we were a bit worried. This is our first episode ever, I think, with two guests. Full episode. I guess we've had yeah. short conversations yeah. with two guests. But at the beginning, we all chatted about you know how we were going to uh, alternate, but it was it was seamless. They're, they're, they, they work extremely well together. Very well. Anything else, Ben, to add to this? No, I mean, get get ready to have your beliefs changed. Exactly. All right. So with that, here's our conversation with Jonathan Burke and Jules Van Dinsbergen. Jonathan Burke and Jules Van Dinsbergen, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Well, we're very happy to be here. It's an honor. Thank you for inviting us. Excellent. All right. So we're going to start with your work on on manager skill, uh, which we were chatting before this is, is some, it's, it's mind blowing work anyway. Um, so for, for, for just keep saying that nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, 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 it really is. Uh, it really is. And, and it's important. Okay. Uh, w- what information does fund performance measured by net or gross alpha contain about manager skill? Well, I think, um, the, I mean, what the, I think, I don't want to say what Jules and R's contribution is. I don't think that's up to us to say, but I will say this, that understanding that the alpha does not measure manager skill and that instead net alpha is a comment on investors, not a comment on managers. 
and understanding that gross alpha doesn't measure anything and that the value added measures the management skill. I, I, I think that's a, it's an important point. And, um, you know, Jules and I, as you know, you, you know about our podcast, it, it, it's an application of, of what we of what economists call equilibrium thinking and what we call on the podcast or our sequel thinking, which is once you think in equilibrium, these things are obvious. And once you if you don't think in equilibrium, you make the mistake. Okay, now now the relationship between manager skill and performance is a pretty commonly held belief. Why is it that they're actually unrelated? Well, I think that the insight is that backward looking over time, you are learning from the performance of a manager about what the skill of the manager is. But given the fact that the size of the fund adjusts to what we think today is the level of the skill of the manager going forward, it doesn't have that predictive power. And I think that the best way, the best analogy to think about is think about how a stock is priced, right? If I asked you, if your grandmother came to you and said, you should, you should really buy Apple stock because I love Apple products. I have every, have every Apple product that's ever been produced. And so for that reason, you should put all your money in Apple stock. What you would say is, well, listen, the price of the stock of Apple is already high. So that going forward, you should not be expecting to get much alpha out of this. In fact, going forward, the return is just a measure of the riskiness of the stock. And so I think our paper is just an application of exactly the same insight, but then to another asset, which is the mutual fund. So even though backward looking, um, the performance of a stock gets you to the high price, and therefore a high price today tells you that a firm is a good company. Going forward, there is not that same relationship. Same thing with managers, backward looking over time, you learn about their skill, but you should not expect the net alpha going forward to be an, uh, an indication of, uh, of the skill of the manager because investors have competed away that rent uh, by all wanting to be with that manager. They've already mm -hmm. flocked and flushed that manager with money. The fund is already big, just as much as with the stock, the stock price is already high. And so going forward, that's going to just uh, erode the performance. I mean, it's a classic or else equal mistake. You know, you ignore the fact that if you have found a positive alpha opportunity, other people would have found it too. Nobody, everybody wants a positive opportunity. And so obviously supply and demand says that can't survive. That's pretty clear. So how should manager skill be measured? Well, I mean, as we say in the paper, it, there's a pretty clear measure. It's called we, we, we def, what we define to be value added, which is the gross alpha multiplied by the size of the fund. So if you think of gross alpha as the underlying, the return the manager makes in excess of the benchmark on the fund he's managing. So it is the extra return he's adding multiplied by how much money he manages. That gives you the total amount of money he has added, or as we like to say, extracted from markets. And that's the measurement of skill. When you look at it that way, it's pretty obvious that that is, in fact, the measurement of skill, because that's what the manager makes. And so what I think our paper does, and I think there was quite a bit of confusion about it before, is there are two separate questions. The first question is, is the manager by trading generating a pie? Yes or no? The second question is, if we divide that pie, who do you think gets most of it? And so mm -hmm. if we are in a situation where there are lots of investors that are all competing for the skill of very few managers, then of course the investors don't have any negotiation power in that relationship. The few managers that have the skill do. And so in a situation where there's this amount of asymmetry in negotiation power, who do you think goes home with the results from the skill? It's going to be the manager themselves. And so for that reason, the fees that they collect is going to be exactly equal to that value added in equilibrium, mm -hmm. which is the same thing as saying that the net alpha to the investors is zero. Right? So you the, know, the, the, I, you know I always it. joke. I mean, it's not totally a joke when I say Marx was right, right? Because what did Marx say? Marx said all the rents accrue to the uh, accrue to labor. Well, that's exactly modern financial markets, right? All the benefits of your labor accrue to you, right? 
capital is not in short supply. There is no reason capital should earn rents. There's lots of competition in the, in the capital markets. That competition competes away any rents, and all the rents go to labor. And the modern economy is exactly that. I mean, that's why Steve Jobs was so wealthy. That's why Mark Zuckerberg is so wealthy. It's because they get the rents. The capitalists don't get the rents. Hmm. You, you mentioned a benchmark being needed to measure value added. How do you choose which benchmark to use? Well, so I think that there are a whole bunch of different candidates that the literature had out there before. And so what we really wanted to do was, we noticed that when we teach the MBA students or any other investment management class, we always use this loose phrase that says something like, oh, you should just put it in passive or you should just index your money. But we wanted to give some empirical content to what that statement actually means. And we came to the conclusion that it means something very different depending on what time uh, sample we're looking at. So for example, before 1977, it's actually pretty difficult to index your money at all. It's very difficult to find index funds. Then in 1977, Vanguard introduces the S&P 500 index fund. And so then you can at least index that. But since then, I think a whole bunch of different funds have been introduced as passive funds. By the way, I also think there's a deeper point here where we really need to question the, this, the clean separation between active and passive, right? There's some mm -hmm. very interesting recent work that shows that ETFs, which everybody loves to call passive, are really very active investment options, right? And just because it's called passive and it sounds popular doesn't mean it's not, it, it is passive, it's actually very active. But what we did in terms of choosing the benchmark is set well, at least everybody can always invest their money in some combination of Vanguard index funds at very low fees. So if we take that linear combination as, as at least always the counterfactual that you can pick as an active fund, you need to have a, a, a need to beat that, right? So that is going to be the, the bar that we hold you accountable against. And we found a, a, a set of very nice, I think it was 13, 11 or 13 funds, I think, that, uh, that Vanguard has. And then there's still a little bit of a question that you can still ask. So for example, Vanguard charges fees too, right? On their index funds. So, so just indexing doesn't actually mean that you get the S&P 500 index itself. There's still transaction costs, there's still management costs. And so, uh, and then there's still the distinction between Vanguard has three different groups that they offer this to. They offer to retail investors that get a different fee than admiral investors that get a different fee to institutional investors. Mm -hmm. So which one is a reasonable benchmark? And I think also there we have quite some nice insights because the price of diversification, uh, which is what, what, what the, the fee is that Vanguard charges is therefore different depending on the amounts of money that you invest. And so you can tailor the benchmark a little bit there, even depending on what sort of investment you're thinking about. Interesting. So why not use factor mimicking portfolios like the Fama French or Fama French Carhartt to measure risk adjusted returns? Um, okay, there's a two part answer to your question. If you believe the factor portfolios are really a risk measure, then it's perfectly fine to use them. But there's not a shred of evidence that these things are risk right? It's just an invented term. You notice it has a positive excess return and you call it risk, right? So I think that, that is, um, you know, academics getting papers published. The second reason to use the factor mimicking portfolios is to say, forget about whether they measure risk. They are, not, they are the next best alternative investment opportunity. I mean, that's, so if you think about what the what an alpha is, it's what you know how much am i adding over my next best investment opportunity and you can interpret the factor portfolios as the next best investment opportunity and i think there jules and i take major issue with it because the factor portfolios don't take into account transaction costs they're not investable portfolios so if you could find a factor portfolio that's an investable portfolio if vanguard said okay we are going to offer this factor portfolio as an investable portfolio, then that is fine to use. But you can't use a factor portfolio that doesn't charge transaction costs and compare that to an active manager who has transaction costs. That's just not a fair comparison. And so, so let me add two more things to that. So the first thing that we do in our paper is that we say, let's take these Fama French factors as, and, as strategies 
and let's see how well they do against the Vanguard benchmarks. And what you find is that you have this enormous outperformance of the Fama French factors compared to these real-time available uh, Vanguard index funds. And so that just shows you that holding managers accountable against such a high bar may not be the right thing to do. And so what I always joke about to the students uh, in class, and it very much uh, adds to what Jonathan said, was that this was the procedure. There's a manager who invents a strategy that works well. There's an academic that sorts the same thing and says, hey, there's a puzzle, there's an anomaly and publishes the paper. The next academic says, hey, these puzzles cannot exist in rational markets. Let's just put it on the right-hand side of the equation of the, of the risk model without there being any justification for putting it there. And then the next academic says, actually, I think if we evaluate that first manager against this new risk model, there's absolutely no evidence that they can outperform anything. Mm -hmm. And we go through that cycle over and over and over again until I think for hedge funds at this point, we're, we're at 13 factor models to try to, exp to, to try to evaluate managers against. And I, I think that has gotten so far away for what a reasonable counterfactual investment opportunity for investors is. That, that I think we need to try to bridge that gap and, and better understand what that gap means. And, uh, and so we think that the counterfactual investment opportunity set is a perfectly reasonable bar in many ways. And, and we discussed it today in class, actually. Even that combination of Vanguard funds may be too sophisticated for a lot of investors, right? Let me just, so the <laughs> ideal thing we would want to measure is this. Suppose that there is an individual investor that puts all their money in one stock, and it's also the one stock of the company they work for. It's the most undiversified investment that you can possibly imagine, because when the firm fails, they lose and their job and their money. Now, suppose that that person can be convinced to put their money into an active fund. Then you can already see that the whole discussion of active versus passive becomes entirely irrelevant because so much value for this investor is added just by um, getting that person to move from that counterfactual to this new counterfactual. So you could even say, is the linear combination of Vanguard index funds a reasonable counterfactual for all investors uh, everywhere in the world? So I think we, in that sense, actually already picked quite a high bar. Uh, for the active managers to uh, to beat, uh, but but it's at least it is an investable opportunity that a rational person could do, which mm -hmm. I think is already a huge improvement over the Fama French factors, which is not an actual investment opportunity that a rational investor could do. I have a follow-up question, but I, I just want to make a comment for our, our our listeners because you guys were very hard on factor models just now, but it, th those were not baseless comments, and and we're going to ask you about your your empirical work on asset pricing models later. But our listeners, because we we often talk about uh, risk factors, I know our listeners are going to be like, "What? What are they talking about?" <laughs> um, my my follow up question: What about using funds that do directly target risk factors, like products from Avantis or Dimensional, as the investable benchmark for this purpose? Uh, yeah, you could. But first of all, those are active funds, right? And they right. charge active fees. So let's start with that. And so, right. so, 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 so those are part of the active space, which, which in some sense is already an interesting, is already an, an interesting fact given who the, um, the brains behind DFA are, right? So that, that's something to at least consider. Uh, but yeah, if, if if they become tradable factors and tradable portfolios, then the after fee returns of those things you could choose to pick those as the counterfactual investment opportunity for investors. Again, taking into account the different levels of fees that different share classes need to pay if that's relevant, right? Hmm. I think um, I think the important thing to understand is we have to be very clear on what a passive investment is. You know, a passive, when we teach it, one of the things we say about the market portfolio is if you truly hold the market portfolio, you are insuring yourself against uh, insider trading to the uh, or asymmetric information to the fullest extent that you can, right? And so that defines the passive. If you move away from that for whatever reason, it could be a totally legitimate reason, like I am working in tech and I don't want the tech part of the passive portfolio. It's a totally legitimate reason to move away from the passive portfolio. But if you move away from that, it's no longer a passive portfolio. Can you can you keep can you reiterate that or say it, say it a different way? I, I think what you just said was important. Yeah, I mean, you mean about the about the about, are you talking about why the market portfolio is 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 an optimal portfolio to hold if you don't have information? Yes. 
Yeah, so this is, I think, a very important point. I mean, we obviously emphasize it when we teach finance, but I think that in general, this is not emphasized enough, which is if you are trading, anytime you trade and you don't have information, if the other side of the person has information, you, you lose, right? That's the nature of the game. If somebody has more information than you and you trade with them, you're on the losing side. So the extent to which that that if you know you don't have information and, and you know there is information out there, what you want to do is don't trade, right? And the way you don't trade is you buy the market portfolio. You buy it once, you hold it, and you sell it. And if you, so I, I, actually it's more subtle than that. It's not just don't trade, but why the market? Why not just any portfolio? The reason why the market is particularly good is you're buying it in the economy wide weights. You're not emphasizing any stock. Somebody with information is going to emphasize some stock over another stock. If you're on the other side of that trade, that means you have the opposite. You're doing exactly opposite to them and you will lose. So what you want to make sure is you're never exactly opposite of somebody with information. How do you do that? You just buy the market because the market, you're not opposite to anything. You're in the weights of the whole economy. Hmm. And, and I think another thing that that brings up that, that I think isn't appreciated enough is the way that we define the market and the way that Jonathan just did, right? There's only one way to do that. It's the market capitalization way, the total of everything, right? And so in that sense, if we had the index fund space and the index fund space was about holding the market, there should only be one product that is offered that offers the market. But I think at this point, we can agree that there are tons of different passive funds. And, and I, th I always think that one of the funniest one is that one of the largest index fund providers uh, in the country, if you read what their perspectives of their value fund says, it says value stocks. So it's a value index fund because it's rules based and they say it's passive. But then it says, Value stocks are generally associated with underpriced stocks that give you an outsized return. But is 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 that really an is, as soon as you sell an outsized return, can we still call this a passive strategy? Does this still qualify? It sounds sounds really like an active fund to me. I mean, that's at least how active funds generally were right. being sold, right? And so holding the market and passive, that actually there's now a wedge between those two statements. It's not the same thing anymore. It used to be the same thing, but in today's investment world, it isn't anymore. Hmm. We, we did do an episode with uh, Adriana Robertson ta talking about her paper, Passive in Name Only, which is, I think, a lot of what you're referring to. Uh, okay, so ba back to skill. Uh, wh when we measure skill as value added, what does the evidence say about the skill of active managers? Oh, it's overwhelming. Active managers are highly skilled. It's something like they add something like $3 million. Average, the average manager adds $3 million a year. But there's an important caveat to that. On average, they add $3 million a year, but the distribution is highly skewed. Most managers destroy value, hmm. but a few managers add an enormous amount of value. Hmm. And the reason, of course, is that the skilled managers have all the money. So there, there are lots and lots of managers that are destroying value, but they're not managing much money. They're not doing a lot of damage, right? Most of the money is concentrated in highly skilled managers. No, and, and so I think the point Jonathan just brought up is, is also very important actually in the passive space, right? Sometimes you see people say statements like, the fact that there are passive funds that charge really high fees is evidence that markets are really, mutual fund markets really are irrational and that there's a problem with them. But what we, we cannot just look at funds on a fund by fund basis and then see how it's allocated. If we find out that the vast majority of money is allocated to the very large index funds that do it correctly, and yes, we can find a few where this allocation didn't optimally happen, that still means that there's overwhelming evidence in the direction that the capital is going to the places where it needs to go. Even if sometimes, yes, and I think Jonathan has some work on that, for the very worst performing funds, yeah, there is a little bit of evidence that people stick with those a little bit too long. I mean, that's old, that may also be true, but that doesn't mean that we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. Generally, the, large, the best managers get the most funds and therefore add the most value. 
I mean, look, the world is full of charlatans. The idea that we're going to get rid of all the charlatans in the world is a little naive. So the question is not, can I find a fund where there's basically a manager ripping off investors? Of course, you're going to be able to find a fund. You can find charlatan doctors. You can find charlatans in all areas of the economy. So that's not the interesting question. The question is, are those funds, are those charlatans large? Are they ripping off many investors? And the answer is definitively not. The vast majority of investors are in funds that are adding a lot of value. Hmm. Interesting. So of those highly skilled managers you're talking about, Jonathan, how much of the value that they add is you know, coming from the like, security selection? How much from market timing? That we can't answer because we didn't ever we didn't look at things. And you know, this is this is a very subtle point. I'm not sure we, we want to get into it over here. I could briefly talk about it, but in, in uh, stock selection in aggregate looks like market timing. So imagine you, let's go back to the argument that the 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 the, uh, the, the market portfolio, you, if you're um, if you're uh, holding the market portfolio, right, um, it means you've insured yourself against asymmetric information. Um, so think about that in aggregate. Say I have a, a bunch of managers that are selecting stocks, right? And let's say everybody's rational in this world, right? So if that's the case, uh, in aggregate, you could just hold the market. And so then you say to me, well, that doesn't make any sense. How is it possible for managers to select stocks and then in the aggregate make money, and yet at the same time, investors can insure themselves against um, uh, uh, uh uh, this asymmetric information by holding the market? And the answer, of course, is market timing. That in aggregate, all the managers by themselves are selecting stocks, but investors are holding the market. So in aggregate, on the other side of that, all the stock selectors aggregate to the to the market because of you know they, they're, they're trading the same. But where the aggregate, but they realize sometimes those managers have information and they're in the market, in aggregates, and sometimes they have information and they're out of the market in aggregates, and investors are on the other side, and that's how they make the extra money. So that's when I when I said to you, investors can insure themselves against uh, by holding the market and by not trading. They do have to trade twice. They have to trade when they get in, and they have to trade when they get out. And when they trade, they will lose money against informed investors. But the point is, you want to minimize that. So mm. you don't have to trade more than twice. I mean, this is a subtle point. You know, it's it's uh, it's hard to do this on a on a one hour podcast to actually go through these these subtle points. No, I, I think you made the point well, though. Um, pa passive investors are still trading against active managers, and if we know active managers are extracting value from the market, passive investors must be losing on those trades. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, w one of the ways that from the research like the Fama French and Carhartt research that we were uh, uh, a lot of people are familiar with they're looking at persistence in skill how, how does persistence look when it's measured by value added oh well, very I mean, interestingly it, it's, it's, it's very persistent right so, so, so I think the, we need to clarify two things. So there are two measures that we, we look at, right? One, as Jonathan mentioned, is investor rationality measured by the net alpha. And that is the persistence that most of the literature has looked at. And then there's the persistence in the value added that you asked about. And the interesting thing is that in the competitive equilibrium that we were talking about, there are very clear predictions about both. The net alpha is not supposed to be predict, uh, persistent. And the reason is, as soon as there is a net alpha, investors flock to that manager, give the manager more money and therefore drive the net alpha back down. So the lack of persistence there is in, is in support of the mechanism. But for the value added, we're supposed to be seeing large persistence. And so what we did was we sorted managers into deciles. We looked at what their value added was up until that point and then evaluate what the value added is for the next one, three, five, seven, and 10 years. And what we find is that even up to 10 years into the future, we see that the managers that had value added in the past still keep on having large value added in the future. So indeed, uh, in that sense, value added is also very persistent. I mean, 
you know, we actually show something else as well, which I which I which I found astonishing once we saw it, because it's such a comment on the rationality of investors. So instead of sorting by past value added, we sorted by managerial compensation. What's managerial compensation? It's the fee they charge times the size of the fund. Now, the thing about managerial compensation is investors determine that. Mm. Investors determine managerial compensation because yep. they decide how big the fund is. Yep. And if you sort by that, so now we're sorting by who investors want to put their money in, who investors think are the best managers. So if we sort by that, you still get incredible persistence, but it's better. Investors are better able to sort managers than past performance. Right. So the investors are able to figure out who the good managers are and then put their money with the good managers. Wow. So that that, that changes the view of mutual fund investors as irrational performance chasers. Oh, that's, I think, one of the biggest uh, misconceptions in the entire academic literature. The idea that mutual fund investors are naive. Every single thing we have done in this space has pointed to the rationality of mutual fund investors to the point that Jules and I now think that mutual fund investors are more rational than stock investors. If you look at the, if you look in the stock market, you see more evidence of irrationality than you do in the mutual fund space. Wow. I mean, look, I've just told you, these investors know who the good managers are and they direct their money. Now, we have other work that that is uh, that explains why you might expect that. One of the things you have to understand is there is an intermediary, meaning the mutual fund, the executives of the mutual fund company, and they're making decisions about how they uh, 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 deploy their talent in the company, right? And those decisions are very highly informed. You know your own employees and you correctly put your employees in the right place. So when I give my money to the mutual fund company, to the mutual fund, I'm taking advantage of the fact that they that are, they are uh, assessing this talent. And that intermediary, I think, makes the market much more rational than, than stocks where you don't have that intermediary. So, so, so another way of saying that is, we know there's a flow performance relationship. So that means you can build large AUM for yourself as a manager by outperforming. But that flow performance channel through investor money is a relatively slow process. It takes you quite a few years of outperformance before you've grown your fund. The quickest way to make a promotion as a manager is if your mutual fund company decides that when Peter Lynch retires, you're going to be assigned to that particular mutual fund. Right. And that then means you get a tons, you get tons of money allocated to you, but there's a downside too. There's a catch too, which is investors don't have to stay with that fund if they don't buy it. So to the extent that the mutual fund company says, this is the successor of Peter Lynch. And then after we see that the fund size drops by double digit percentage numbers, that does mean that people are saying, yes, we believe this manager is very good but not as good as Peter Lynch. And therefore Mm -hmm. we are withdrawing some of the capital from that particular fund. And we indeed did see that fund shrink after Peter Lynch retired and a new manager was was, was assigned. Jules, I mean, let's just be clear. The the mutual fund company is doing their best to replace Peter Lynch with somebody as good as Peter Lynch. And they have the most information to do that. They know their own employees. And actually, if you look at it, in the the end, of course, Magellan shrunk a lot. But initially, it did look like the initial manager that took after Peter Lynch were able to um, uh, uh, continue doing what Peter Lynch was doing because it takes that you don't see the big outflow until two or three manager replacements after Peter Lynch. Now, I don't know why they were replacing all those managers, but you know, there is some, some extent, but of course, that's a very specific case. I mean, of course, I think it's very unfair to to use that in the sense that I think everybody agrees that Peter Lynch is the greatest money manager that's ever lived, right? And so obviously it's going to be impossible to replace somebody of that quality. But generally what we find in our research is that the mutual fund companies are exceptionally good at replacing managers with managers that are just as good. Hmm. 
Well, well so yeah, so to be precise, what we find is that when a mutual fund company turns over the managers and reallocates the funds between them, we see that the value added after goes up meaning wow. that the reallocation actually works so they so and and it, i do think that it is not hard to believe that the mutual fund management companies have more information about the managers than the investors do because one of the things that investors have as a downside is that the one of the most important information sources that they have is realized returns and so that's what they can learn from. They can do a little bit more research on the manager, but the mutual fund management company can observe every action and every choice and can also observe the, ration the rationale behind it and the whole decision-making process. And most importantly, what the mutual fund management company can observe is all the stocks that were not picked uh, and, and which were considered but were turned down for particular reasons. So they can, they can really see the decision-making process and that I think gives them an informational advantage. And indeed the data suggests that that informational advantage pays off, uh, more value added after management turnover on average. So should investors be spending more effort on analyzing mutual fund companies as opposed to managers? Yes, and they do. In they other do. words, Interesting. They, they look at the space. I think the space is dominated by five companies. Right. Right. So it is. They, they invest do that. They give most investors give their money to one of five companies. Huh. That's true. I'm just curious if they think about the fund company level as opposed to the individual. But I, you know, level. we have we we actually have evidence on that. So when we wrote the paper. Here was the issue. We showed definitively that when when the firm, when the mutual fund company makes managerial changes, the value added goes up, right? But if you think about that, how does that benefit the company? I mean, great, the value added goes up, but their fees are the size of the funds. So unless investors see the managerial change and react by investing more money, they're not going to get any benefit out of this. But that's exactly what you see. Hmm. When the mutual fund company makes managerial changes, more money is invested and exactly the equilibrium. Because, of course, if more money was not invested, there'd be a positive alpha. Right? Because I told you, value added went up. And it's exactly what you see. You see an inflow of funds driving the alpha down to zero and the mutual fund company grabs the, uh, the rents. And so, yes, investors are aware of this. So, so the flow relationship even holds at the firm level in some sense. Yeah. That's one way to think about it. So, so the whole mutual fund firm grows in its total AUM across all funds in response to the reallocation. So even if the percentages in the fees stay the same because the total AUM has grown, the total revenue of the mutual fund company has just gone up. Hmm. So why has so much of the literature and study on this been focused on individual security pricing and not at evaluating manager skill? I think that, well, let's just start with the fact. The literature was very confused. I mean, until, the, until 20 years ago, we wouldn't even question the idea that alpha measures skill. Nobody would even question. To this day, you were still... Jules and I still referee papers where they use alpha as a measure of skill. And so if you're going to make that fundamental mistake, it's going to lead to a lot of inferences. So, of course, it led to the main inference that managers weren't skilled. And if you and that was dogma in the industry for, mo, you know, in my entire academic career, career until I wrote the paper, that was dogma, which is that managers weren't skilled and investors were, were irrational. And so if you come to it from that perspective, you don't even think about asking questions like, why do mutual fund companies exist? Why are there only five of them? What are mutual fund executives doing? You know, how, are the, how is talent allocated? You know, one of the reasons Jules and I wrote that paper about talent was obviously we were interested in mutual funds, but as economists, we were much more interested in a bigger question, which is how do firms operate? How does talent get allocated within the firm? This is a big economic question. It's very difficult to get data on. Most firms are not opa opaque. The great thing about a mutual fund company is its transparency. You can use data to actually answer a question like this. 
And to, to, to add to, to your question, right, there, I think that one argument that was made was because no mutual fund manager can do anything or beat the market, if you will, that would then be supportive evidence for the fact that the stock market was perfectly what has been called efficient, right? But the problem with that argument is that arguing that the stock market for that reason is perfectly efficient comes at a humongous cost, which says you must argue then at the same time that the entire multi-trillion dollar mutual fund market is completely irrational and everything that happens there is therefore not efficient. And so given the fact that there's so many investors that operate in both markets at the same time, it's sort of weird to argue that when they operate in one market, they do everything perfectly and everything works. And then when they move to this other market, suddenly they lose their head and everything about it is irrational. And so for that reason, I think that the insight, the impossibility of efficient markets that we need to have um, uh, active managers that get prices to where they need to be, that also has large real economic value, by the way, um, I think is, is an important one. But it also implies that there is a place for these active managers. And therefore, the truth is much more in the middle. Right. And so, so we can even argue, as Jonathan said earlier, once we move to more rationality from mutual funds and less rationality and more frictions, if you will, in regular stock markets, you can even ask the question, well, is it, are there more frictions in mutual fund markets or are there more frictions or irrationality in stock markets? And I think that the literature should spend much more time trying to evaluate the relative rationality of the two as opposed to picking the two corner solutions where we just say stock markets are perfectly rational and perfectly efficient and mutual fund markets are just the, the, the entire enterprise is is, uh, is irrational you know jules <laughs> spoke about it earlier and earlier but i just want to re-emphasize that the art if you but the argument that is used for what people call the efficient market hypothesis if you use that argument in mutual funds then the logical result is the alpha is zero. So, you know, um, uh, uh, the making the argument that if I see a zero or negative alpha in the mutual fund space, that means stock markets are efficient is, is a non sequitur, right? Because you expect to get zero alpha. Zero net negative, alpha. Zero yep. net alpha, right? Yep. That's what the that's the implication of efficient markets. You expect to get it. You do not expect to get a positive alpha. Can, can you talk more about why it's a, a, a zero net alpha as opposed to a negative net alpha in equilibrium? Well, remember what net alpha measures. Net alpha measures the rationality of investors. And I, when I talk, when I when I teach this, I tell us I, I do the following. I say to students, what is what if let's say we saw a positive net alpha? In mutual funds, what would that mean? That would mean markets weren't competitive, right? That would mean there were positive net present value opportunities on the table. Investors had an ability to make money, and they weren't taking they weren't they weren't taking those opportunities. And that only could happen if markets weren't competitive. And what does it mean if the net alpha is negative? Well, that means investors are making mistakes. They're investing in negative net present value opportunities. They are committing too much money to mutual funds, right? That's what a negative net alpha means. And a zero net alpha means the market is both competitive and investors are fully rational. Now, the question is, do we in fact see a negative net alpha? And one of the things Jules and I noticed is that much of the negative net alpha derives from two mistakes. The first mistake is not taking into account transaction costs, right? If you, if you compare a manager that's paying transaction costs against a, a factor that mm. isn't, of course, it's going to be negative. So that's the first reason why you see a negative in alpha. The other reason is the data set that that um, uh, uh, the academic studies use for reasons that Jules and I cannot fathom. The first study only looked at domestic U.S. funds. I don't mean funds sold in the United States. I mean funds that only invest in U.S. stocks. If you do that, you cut out, you cut the data set by two thirds. You throw out one third of the data set for no apparent reason at all. It's like no, no, no. investing. You throw out two thirds of the data set. You're left with one third. Oh, of the one data third. Set. Sorry, right. Mm. So <laughs> you, I mean, you know, rule number one when you when you're teaching PhD students, it's never throw out data. 
or if you're going to throw our data, you have to have a very, very good reason. If you put that data back in there, and you you and you measure you, and you measure the um, the 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 fund against a transactable benchmark, yeah. then you get a net alpha of zero, exactly what you expect, which is consistent again with the fact that mutual fund investors are actually highly rational. <laughs> and, and so to add to that, I think one helpful way to think about it is stock selection and mutual fund selection are exactly the same game, right? So when I say to you, buy Apple because Apple is a good company, you say, wait a second, first tell me how much I'm paying for Apple because maybe Apple is already overpriced. So it's a good company, I admit, but that doesn't mean that it's a good deal. Maybe I'm paying too much for it and therefore the alpha could be negative. So the alpha is negative if the price is too high, the alpha is positive if the price is too low. So now let's translate exactly that insight to the mutual funds. The question you need to ask is, given the quality of the manager, just like the quality of the company, how big is the fund? If the fund is too big, expect a negative net alpha. If you think the fund is too small and therefore not enough capital has been allocated to this fund, then you can just as much with the low stock price for Apple, you buy the stock. In this case, you get into the mutual fund and then uh, you can still expect to get some alpha going forward, right? And so, and there are examples in the literature where you can do exercises like this. Although I think a lot of the papers that do this, they, they, they draw the wrong conclusion. So for example, let me give you a very simple example that I think is a very nice example. Managers with foreign sounding names have positive alphas, right? Now, some people say, well, from that, I can learn that foreign sounding managers are skilled. And the answer is no. Remember, the net alpha teaches you something about the rationality of investors, not about the skill level. So what have I learned from this? Investors are not allocating enough money to managers that have foreign sounding names. That's wild. I, wh That's whether, or not, whether or not they're better or worse than managers with English sounding names is an entirely different question. The only wow. question that we've established is, have these managers been allocated enough money given how good they are? That's all we've established. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, it's 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 crazy stuff. Well, I, I, when I when I read your paper, your your two thousand four paper, Jonathan, for the first time, this stuff blew my mind then, and it's blowing my mind again now. Why why do you think that it took so long for the literature for for your papers, I guess, to apply rational expectations both to fund investors just as we do with the the stock market? Um, that's a deep question. That's a deep question about how research works. Um, you know, you could ask another question. It's, you know, Rick and I wrote the paper, the first draft, I think was 2002, maybe. So now it's 20 years ago. And it's still not fully appreciated. Right. right? It's 20 years have passed. Um, I think the answer is that we have an idealized view of how research occurs. And I don't think this is just economics. I think this is everything. But that, in fact, the reality is very different. That, that, that human behavior is much more important determinant of how research progresses. And so if a famous professor gets up and makes a and has a theory that might be that at the time people are not, you know, don't want to question correctly or it becomes dogma, but it turns out to be wrong. It takes an extremely long time for that theory to be uh, to be overturned. And so, you know, there's the famous Kuhn book, you know, where he talks about the structure of scientific revolutions. But I think that the Kuhn idea that you have to wait for the young people to arrive, for the idea to die, is actually naive. I think it's much worse than that. I think it's the ideas are might outlive the people because of fads and... Um, you know, I mean, it's hard for me not to comment on this in today's society. When the, and Jules and I are going to do a podcast on the question of of freedom of speech and things like that. You know, you you Jules and I do not think of freedom of speech as some kind of religion. It's in the Constitution. It's part of our culture. We think of it as a critical part of a of making a business or research work. So, to coming back to your point, I think that within academics, within research. We don't have enough people who actually are willing to step out with new ideas. 
right? There's a lot of pressure in society to not say new things. Even it comes down to small things like, oh, I'm going to sound like an idiot, so I don't want to say it. And I think that really largely explains why research progresses in this way. I mean, you know, there's this book on cancer called The Emperor of All, Malady, of All Maladies. And one of the things when you read that book, you realize how, how you could have a medical procedure, a medical treatment for which there is no basis whatsoever, not one ounce of evidence that it works, last 100 years. Mm. Right. So, you know, the way research works is this idea of just, oh, well, we'll figure it out. We'll always do the good thing. It doesn't work that way. No, and it's, I think it's even worse. I mean, I think sometimes we even mean revert. Sometimes we take steps backwards. Right. I, I, I had to PhD students in a project in my class evaluate some of these things and, and come up with the best examples they could find. At some point, there was this theory that because out of a rotting piece of meat, you, you just get flies coming out of it. There was this theory that life would just start to uh, arise automatically out of other previously living things, right? And so for a while, that was the theory. And then at some point, somebody did an experiment and one of them was covered uh, so that the air could get through, but the flies couldn't get in and the other one wasn't. And then you would see the life come through in one and not in the other. And people said, you see, it's not, it's really not the theory that we had before. That was then rejected, but decades later, it just returned again. I mean, we just we just went back to that theory, even though it had already been disproven before. And so I think research isn't even a, a linear path towards progress. Sometimes we make several steps backwards. And I think the other thing that Jonathan has said, which I think is incredibly important, is we need to be very careful that scientific consensus that arrives from moral pressure is no consensus at all. When 97% of scientists say that the sun evolves around the earth due to moral pressure, we can say there's scientific consensus on this issue, but that scientific consensus is meaningless. And so we want to listen to the voices of Galileo Galilei, Galileo Galilei who, who are the outliers, the ones that everybody thinks are morally reprehensible. Everything was wrong with them, right? He was accused of everything under the sun and even was forced to recant what he said earlier. And so I think we, I hope that, that particularly in the US in these days, we can sustain an environment where people are allowed to bring forward non-conventional theories so that we remain open to them and keep testing them and use the scientific method to make progress with them. I mean, you know, one of the things you could take a step back and think about, and we should think about, is, is how physics was able to transform to theories that was so seemingly outrageous, right? I mean, it, I can think of no other field where somebody stepped up to the plate and said, time is a function of how fast you move, right? Or uh, the, uh, a, a particle is not a particle. It's a wave function, right? And you, the, it, I think it's astonishing how physics was able to transform in a way that I don't think many fields could. And the question we could ask ourselves is, what is, what is it about physics that were, they were able to do that? Hmm. It, it's, it's fascinating hear, hearing you guys talk about this because it, it probably took me eight, eight years of, you know, having gone through the CFA program and done an MBA with finance concentration and all that stuff. <laughs> To learn about your work on manager skill, whereas before that it was all, uh, well, look, the, the the net alphas are negative, and uh, yeah. Anyway, it's a th that that commentary with that context is very interesting. So many listeners will be familiar with Bill Sharp's arithmetic of active management. So how does the equilibrium zero net alpha fit in that framework? Yeah, I mean, Bill Sharp is a good friend of mine, but unfortunately, on this particular one, he is wrong okay it's uh and let me be very explicit let me make let me just explain bill sharp's arithmetic so we all know what it means bill sharp's arithmetic is look um eh, 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 the uh some of everybody's portfolio is the market portfolio the sum of active managers the active managers have a portfolio then we have everybody else that sums to the market portfolio so that means the sum of everybody's portfolio can't outperform the market portfolio Right. So the only way active managers could make money is if they take it away from everybody else. It has to be a zero sum game. 
Where I think Bill made a mistake was he forgot about the fact that um, people pay for liquidity. Another way of saying that is I know, let's say I am a fully rational passive investor and I say I would like to uh, invest in the market. I know that there's going to be two places where I'm going to expose myself to information. Once when I get in and once when I get out. And I take that as given. And I say, that's the cost of transacting. Right? And that breaks the arithmetic. Because, of course, when I go in and I get out, they're going to make money off me. Even though I'm always holding the market. Right? When I get in, I buy the market. And when I get out, I buy the market. And and but, by, by the way, yeah. th there are lots of investors that are getting in every month and getting out every month, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody that's in their passive investing or is saving for retirement. There are tons of investors that are constantly getting in and out out of passive vehicles. So it's not it, this is not just a theoretical thing. This is also pragmatically very important. But secondly, I think the second argument that needs to be made here is. You know, you cannot just split up the world and say, you know, the passive investors hold the market and I call everybody else active. And then I just equate those active managers with these active investors with active managers, right? There's still a very large group of people in the ones that don't hold the market that actually are not active mutual fund managers. So, the, so, so even there, the arithmetic already doesn't add up. Right, so so you need to think about all the other people that are holding individual stocks or are doing things on their own or think that they're smarter than everybody else and are in the market. Those investors obviously can get exploited by that behavior as well. And so an, an active manager that trades against those people will also win because they have an informational advantage. But then on top of that, indeed, even all the passive ones need to get in and out all the time, and that leads to the further uh, distortion of the summing up constraint. And so it's it's a good benchmark to think about, but but. As with, with many benchmarks that we have in finance, say, for example, Modigani Miller and other things, as soon as we've established a benchmark, we do have to immediately start thinking about the frictions so that the, the frictions make the, the, the equilibrium interesting, not, uh, not, not the frictionless benchmark that, that was proposed here. Okay, so we've established from your from your research that managers are, in fact, skilled and that investors are able to identify them ex ante. Uh, who actually benefits from that skill, though? The managers. And so so, so the, the example I do in class is a very simple one. And we actually did it in, in one of the podcasts, in the All Else Equal podcast, when we talked about capitalism, right? I first say to the students, we've all spent the whole day making shoes. We're 100 students in the class. 99 people make a left shoe. One person makes a right shoe. So right. one of the students in the class made the right shoe. And then I say, a pair of shoes goes for $100. I also made a left shoe. And so I approached the only person with the right shoe and I said, you know, Karl Marx said that how much time you spend making something determines its value. We yeah. both spent the whole day making it. I proposed that we both get 50 bucks and then we sell the one pair of shoes. And then regardless of who the student is or what their political beliefs are, by the way, they always turn down that offer. They immediately say, no way, you're not getting $50 for this. And I say, well, explain to me why you feel that that's the case. And then they say, well, I have all the negotiation power because there are 98 other people in the class that I could go to for a left shoe. So I have the thing in short supply. You have the thing in large supply. So who gets all the rents? And then I say, well, how much do you think the person with the right shoe gets? And invariably, the class comes to the conclusion that it's somewhere between 99 and and $100. So that, that almost everything goes to the person who has the one right shoe. And so after saying that, I say to, to them, well, to do investment management, I need two inputs. Instead of the left and the right shoe, I need investable money and I need mutual fund manager skill. Now tell me which one of the two is in short supply. And so very quickly, they come to the conclusion that having investable money makes you in no way special because everybody has investable money. And so it's very difficult to call that a skill in short supply. The skill of the manager is something that is in short supply. So who is going to go home with the rents from this process? Just like the right shoe owner, they go home with everything. The manager goes home with everything. And so the value added is entirely absorbed by the manager in terms of fees, which, by the way, is exactly the same reason for why the net alpha is zero. Because the, in this left and right shoe example, the net alpha is the amount of money the left shoe owner goes home with. And that's going to be close to nothing. Right? Mm. So that's uh, so, so, so there, there you have you know, it. You know, it, it, listening to Jill's talk, it, it's just fascinating because there's all this angst in the world right now about how unfair the world is and everything else. 
And if I think a hundred years ago, you turned around to somebody and you described the world today, they would have said we'd, we were living in paradise, right? Think about it. A hundred years ago, the, there was a situation where capital earned rents, right? Rich people who happen to just be rich because their parents were rich were able to earn rents on their capital, right? Completely gone away. There is no way capitalists earn rents, right? If you want to earn a positive alpha on your money, you have to work damn hard at it. Go and try to find an investment that you can do. Right? Yeah, do it's exactly the it's exactly the utopia that people wanted, which is the only people that make money are the people who provide a skill in short supply. People who provide something nobody else can provide that everybody wants. And the fair and the way you, the utopia is those people get the value of their of what they do, right? No, and 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 so so the other thing to add to that is if you think about how many people directly or indirectly through their pension plans are capital owners today, almost everybody in the economy today that participates in a pension plan is actually a capital owner. Yep. And I think that one, I mean, it's a bit of a tongue in cheek, but that if you look at how underfunded all the pension plans are, I think that being a capital owner doesn't exactly give you the fantastic rents that everybody thought it was going to give, right? Because otherwise it should be relatively simple to fund all these pension plans if there were all these excessively large rents on capital owners. And so the, all of the pension plans are all struggling to get an extra percent alpha two on their investments. I mean, the rates of return on capital are so astronomically low, interest rates are Finally, starting to come back up, but they've been at such low levels for so such a long time, and and uh, uh, you know even stock markets in terms of their future returns have ultra low levels. So I think that's all consistent with the idea that the returns on capital are just not very high anymore. I mean, think about the world we live in, where some guy with no capital whatsoever, but a good idea, can easily raise capital to open a business and make himself wealthy. That's what most people would think of utopia 100 years ago. We have access to capital like that. Anybody can has this access to capital. It's interesting, Jonathan, you mentioned that because I listened to that episode on capitalism this morning, and then I turned on the news, and there's a new report out from one of the big banks citing the large increase in the number of millionaires around the world. And then that bridged into a discussion about how this is um, increasing the inequity in society, which is directly in contrast of your conversation you have with Professor Cochran on that episode. Well, can we first start to establish that if inflation rates are 10, 20, 30 percent, that the number of millionaires will go up? <laughs> right. <laughs> Just because, <laughs> I mean, so, so, so let, let's start with that. But uh, because the value of that million is not the same as it used to be. So, so, so let's start with that. But I do think there's quite a bit of research on wealth inequality. And I think there are very important measurement issues that need to be taken into account. For example, when we establish wealth inequality, some researchers here at the Wharton School, it matters a lot whether social security is, is measured as part of the wealth of, yeah. the, of, of American households, yes or no. If you count it, then the increase in wealth inequality is really not that big at all. And particularly if you go to this wealth inequality database by Zuckman and Sass and so forth, if you plot the wealth inequality numbers, not just for the last decade or two, but since, say, 1850, you see this enormous decrease in it, exactly consistent with the, the, the statements Jonathan just made. And then we can debate a bit whether at the end it comes back up a little bit, depending on how you take Social Security into account. But even though I think we should have a serious debate about wealth inequality and what we, whether that's a problem, what we should do about it, it's also fine to, to acknowledge how much progress in that sense has been made and how much it's been decreased since, uh, say, 1850, right? Yeah, I can't resist. I mean, these very, you know, obviously these uh, newspapers want to want, need to sell newspapers. So nothing better than to a headline that says more millionaires and all this other stuff. But let's just let's just make the following observation. One of the big differentiators in our society in terms of wealth inequality is whether you have a bachelor's degree or whether you don't. And those same people that constantly complain about wealth inequality have just proposed to let, uh, to forgive student loans. Now, what is that? That is a strict transfer of wealth from people without bachelor's degrees to bachelor's 
degrees. And what do you think that's going to do to the wealth inequality? It's going to increase wealth inequality. So, you know, it, it, it's just very hard for me to listen to this, uh, uh, you know, this, the, the self-serving debates and, and newspapers selling things when, in fact, the data is overwhelming, especially on a worldwide basis. What do we li- oh, oh, you know, the, the same people that complain about immigration and how they and, and, and worry about the environment and the whole world are suddenly, oh, no, it's wealth inequality in the United States. Well, if you really care about the world and you care about everything, what are you focusing on the United States for? Let's talk about wealth inequality in the world, which mm. is at an all time low. And again, a hundred years ago, if you told people the fraction of the world that is living out of poverty, they would have told you we lived in utopia. It would have been inconceivable to them. The mm. fraction of the world today that living out of poverty, no, everybody eats today. No, it's so yeah, so it's astonishing. So, so, what has been achieved is absolutely astonishing on a worldwide basis. No, so so if you see the whole world as one country, indeed, then the wealth inequality inside that country has gone down tremendously, right? Because a lot of developing markets did really not have any wealth a while ago, and now they have lots of wealth, and so all of that wealth inequality has decreased, and and arguably that has come at the cost of somewhat higher wealth inequality in developed. Uh, countries. But again, if if you care about the world and you care about everybody in the world, then uh, maybe that is worth it because, you know, there, there, there are many people that have been lifted out of poverty in the last couple decades alone. And indeed, if you look at that world hunger, uh, it's it we're going to reach a lot of targets for world hunger much quicker than people thought right mm-hmm. now we'll see how the recent energy crisis and inflation crisis and the war uh, in ukraine and all of those things are going to contribute potentially to reversing that trend but we were on a pretty good path before all of these things hit that is for sure true yeah okay. you know in, in i don't know if you've read this book by steve coonan called unsettled but in there there's a graph that's just fascinating and again, people don't appreciate this. He he um, he graphs the number. I think it's the uh, uh, maybe either the number of deaths or the costs of natural disasters over the last hundred years. And that graph is precipitously down. It's exponentially declining over the last hundred years. And just take a step back. Think about how much. Um, uh, 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 welfare has increased by the fact that the effect of natural disasters has been so minimized over the last hundred years. At the same time, we're hearing people telling us that the natural disasters are, are you know, are, it's the end of the world with all these natural disasters. It's a complete, um, uh, uh, you know, appreciation of the fact that we, you know, the, the welfare that we've created has been enormous and that we should be celebrating the world we live in, precisely because of the equality and the lives saved and the quality of life. Yeah, because it's not a given that we can keep it. If we're not careful with it, we could lose it again, right? There have been there have been many events in human history where people have turned on each other and where the, there are many recent examples of countries where changes in regimes have really led to large decrease. Think about Venezuela, what happened there. Right, and so so it's it's not a given that we can keep it. We have to we have to appreciate what we have. Doesn't mean we shouldn't improve it if we can. I mean that's also important. But let's not throw away the baby with the bathwater. That seems that seems important too. Let's keep what was working before, and let's try to improve the the things that weren't working. Well, I, I want to bring our conversation back to a topic that seems relatively much less important than what we just veered off into. <laughs> um, is is it possible? to identify skilled fund managers before the benefits of their skill are absorbed by the size of their fund? Well, I gave you an example of that, right? So so if if it's the case that you think people are making a mistake, and so if a foreign sounding name means that people mm. are not on the, on the ball and therefore they're too slow in the capital allocation, as, as just as much as if you think that the that the information about Apple that just came out is not properly incorporated by the market in the price because they're making a mistake and there's a good reason to believe they make a mistake, you can bet on that. If you think that there's a mistake made by in the capital allocation process, and, and there are reasons for why people are irrational in the decision-making process, 
yet and you could try to exploit that mm -hmm. but but it, it it does have to be something where you know that the market you know something better than the market either because the market is making a mistake or because you know something before they do just as this with stocks now that said we do see that the flow performance relationship which which is this equilibri equilibrating mechanism it is not as fast as with stock markets hmm. right so it is with with uh, with stock markets or with bond markets i think you know within an hour or 90 minutes generally we see we see prices quickly converge to the new equilibrium level that they have so with the flows of the mutual funds there are some frictions there that make it take that that can sometimes take a little longer for the flows to happen they still happen um, but uh, it, it, I think the, the flow performance uh, relationship peaks after six months or something, three to six months. Hmm. So the little bit of evidence that we do have on alpha predictability is therefore at the very short horizon, but it hmm. very quickly mean reverts and disappears. Okay. Right? So, so it's if you're willing to, uh, you know, if you're willing to move your money every three months, there is hmm. evidence that you could uh, uh, exploit the fact that an investor, the flow performance relationship is is slower but that said if you have inside information then of course you can make or i would i, I don't mean inside information it's illegal inside information and privileged information then of course you can make money because there are lots of managers that are that have too little money to manage relative to their true ability but the point is it's very hard for individual investors to have information it's not hard for the for the mutual fund companies I mean, that's oh, the point wow. that our other paper, the mutual fund companies know who the good managers are and they move the capital. Okay. I, I, I've got a question. So we, <laughs> we had Gus Sauter, who was the former CIO at Vanguard for, for many years. I know him. He, he, yep. Yeah. Okay. So he, he made this comment to us. He said that because of his position at the company, he, he felt that he did know that there were some active managers that he could allocate to. And he believes in active management. And that sounds like it perfectly aligns with what you guys are talking about. Exactly what we found. Wow. Exactly what we found. I very, mean, it very is interesting. interesting. You know, Jules and I are academics, and it's very interesting as an academic to then talk to practitioners about what they or themselves are doing. One of the things you may say to me is, you know, well, don't the practitioners already understand what they're doing? And they do in their own world. But yeah. generally, practitioners have never taken a step back and thought about how they fit into the big picture. And that's where when you have discussions with them, they they suddenly begin to see where you're coming from in the big picture. And, you know, they it's an interesting process. Well, so, so, so to give you one example, right? One place where I think that the way the practitioners talk about the problem is exactly consistent with what we've been talking about is this. Two mutual fund managers meet and they have to determine the hierarchy between them. Do you think that the first information they exchange is what the last what the alpha over the last quarter the last year or the last five years was what do you think is the piece of information that they first say to each other uh, how big income is, or the size of the fund yeah how big is your fund and so so that that obviously is exactly consistent with what we've been saying that is that the skill how how competent they are is very quickly communicated through how much money you manage not through what alpha you've been making hmm. well wow. so we, we we had gene fam on our podcast a while ago for for episode 200, so 20 episodes ago. And his comment was that the strongest evidence for efficient capital markets is that active management is a negative sum, sum game. What are the implications uh, from your research on efficient market hypothesis for the stock market? Well, as you said earlier, I think it's it's they're much closer to each other than was previously suggested. Right, to, the, to the fact that the stock markets are completely rational and mutual fund markets are completely irrational, that that's a corner solution that doesn't seem reasonable. I think that we need to move both towards each other. Mutual fund markets are more rational than we thought before. And I think that more and more evidence in the stock market literature seems to suggest that, for example, all of these factors that we studied before, there's more and more evidence that they are not proxying for risk, which suggests that maybe the stock markets aren't as efficient as we thought before. And mm. so now I think the reason real research question that at least to me and I'm sure to Jonathan is also interesting is where exactly do these two meet or do they even cross over to the other mm. side and so I, I think that one way to think about it is this all markets in the economy have a certain level of competitiveness you have stock markets you have bond markets you have labor markets you have product markets you have housing markets you have mutual fund markets 
And so ranking them by how competitive they are is a much more interesting exercise than to say, is the stock market efficient or not? Efficient just means perfectly competitive, and perfectly competitive is a theoretical construct that we know in reality can never be true anyway. In mm. fact, the famous paper on the impossibility of efficient markets says that that corner solution can never be true. So it's not a matter of whether they're efficient or not. It's just how competitive are they and also relative to each other. Mm. Now, I think that we can all agree that financial markets are much more competitive than labor markets, because if you want to fill a position in your firm, you're, you're searching for I don't know how long, and there are tons of costs that are associated with having to do that. I think that finding a house is a much less um, a competitive market in the sense that the search friction of finding the right house or the buyer and the seller bringing them together. And there are tons of fees with intermediaries that charge for that. So there's also so that those are much less efficient. Even product markets, I would say, are much are, are much less competitive than financial markets. I shouldn't say efficient. I should say competitive. Um, now, but the key question that we were just debating is which market is more competitive: mutual fund markets or stock markets, and how does that relate to each other? And I think that a lot of research should go in that direction in trying to establish those two things. I mean, Jules, I think, is being a little bit too polite to Team Farmer. Team Farmer is just wrong about this. Okay. The active, if you observe that the that the alpha in mutual funds is negative, tells you absolutely nothing about efficient markets as he defines it. It mm. tells you that too much money has been allocated to active management, right? Mm. His own theory, which he apparently does not appreciate, says he expects the alpha to be zero. So if the alpha is negative, that is... A, it's it's evidence against his theory. It's right. evidence against the idea that people are rational. His theory requires competitive rational markets. Hmm. So he's just wrong about that. What can I say? So given that the benefits of skill go to the managers, what should individual investors do? Well, what I tell my students is I say, look, I am, to derive, you know, some people love to follow the stock market. And I'm sure you, many of your listeners are fit in that category. That's why they listen to this podcast. I don't. I couldn't get, I find it boring. I couldn't care less what happens in the stock market. So for me, if I were to spend my time looking at mutual fund managers and trying to find good ones, I would find that a disutility, right? But there are many people that that's, that's different for. They enjoy the process of finding managers and finding stocks. So if you're a person like me, what you should do is stick your money in passive management and forget about it, which is exactly what I do. But if you're one of those people that enjoys the process of investing and searching for managers, then what you should do is search for active managers. What Jules and I have already said is the flow of funds relation is slow. So... If you're ahead of the game and you're prepared to move your money every four, every three to six months between managers, you can make extra money. It's just like the stock market. If you really enjoy researching stocks, you can try to compete with the T. Rowe prices of the world. And, um, you know, most likely you won't, but you could try and it, it, you're getting enjoyment out of it. Right. Right. And so that's my advice. My advice, if you don't get enjoyment out of it, put your money in the market and forget about your investment and start withdrawing when you retire. And if but, but, you can enjoy out of it, you know, you're welcome to try to find good managers. But it, but it is this catch-22, right? In the sense that it is the competition between the investors that are trying it that makes it ineffective, right? As soon as this Apple stock is underpriced, the fact that everybody immediately goes towards it and tries to buy it at this lower price and the competition between them makes the market maker update on what the right price needs to be and therefore instantaneously the price jumps up and then in the end very few people if any are going to be making money out of that process because the competition is so intense but it, it is the catch-22 because in the sense that if nobody would engage in that process then of course it would never happen and so it, it, it therefore there needs to be a little bit of friction for people to for this i think to, this like the oil that 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 makes the wheels go i mean it, it, so you need a little bit of friction there that that as jonathan describes can make it work 
But in the end, I mean, you do need to realize that you're playing a super competitive game. And so in super competitive games, there are not a lot of winners. I mean, it's much easier to play a game where there's not a lot of competition and then everybody can make lots of rents. The f f financial markets are, you can, you can say many things about them. I mean, there's some frictions, but that they're very uncompetitive. I, I, I wouldn't describe them that way. <laughs> mm. And with, with allocating to funds, you're not trading against the big institutions, but you are allocating against the big institutions. Like you guys talked earlier about how fund companies play an important role in allocating to managers. Yeah, so, so, so they are already making sure that the capital allocation can happen quickly, right? right? But we also said that the company as a whole gets more money allocated because the value added of all of the managers goes up because this allocation step helps. And so hmm. there's still, if no extra money would be allocated to the company, the mutual fund company as a whole, then the, oh, okay. the fee revenue of the company would stay the same. And all of the benefit from this reallocation step would accrue to the investors. So there again, there's this competitive step where the investors compete with each other for getting those rents, therefore make the whole, the whole company's AUM bigger. And therefore, in the end, again, go home with little to nothing. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's a sad you know, it's the same thing with the left and the right shoe example, right? The 99 people that are competing with each other. I mean, if they could collude, they could huh. get something out of that that uh, situation. But if they can't collude, then uh, unfortunately, the outcome is they're not going to get very much. And so that's just the reality of it. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I do want to ask more about asset pricing models, though, just to finish our conversation. You guys have both talked about how uh, multi-factor asset pricing models, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that those are not representative of risk. Can you talk a little bit about your research on that? Um, maybe just quickly, how did you test that and what are the implications for multi-factor asset pricing? So I think that the way we did it is simply this. We said the flow performance relationship is an indication of people chasing um, a positive MPV opportunity. Like if the stock is underpriced, then you go for it. If the mutual fund is too small, you go for it. So if a manager outperforms, that means you update positively on how good they are, which means that the current size is not as big as it should be because the manager is bigger and can handle more money than you thought before. And therefore you get to see this flow. But if we see people voting with their feet, why don't we use the voting with their feet to figure out what benchmark they use to cast their vote? And so what we said was, here are 10 different models, benchmark models. Let's compute outperformance relative to each of these 10 models. And again, some models a manager may have outperformed and against another they haven't. And then we see with, whether the voting with their feet coincides with that measure of outperformance. And then we're going to see which model best predicts how people vote. Mm. And so when we did that, we found out that the CAPM outperformance relative to the CAPM actually was the best model in the sense that that best predicted how people vote with their feet and that these additional factors had no, if even negative, explanatory power in terms of predicting how people vote with their feet. And so therefore, at least it seemed that people are not using those models when they make their capital allocation decisions. Now you can still say, well, these are not the people that set the, the, the what we call in finance, the, the stochastic discount factor. They're not the ones who determine what the benchmark model should be. But as we already established, there's a very large group of people that participates in mutual fund markets. And if for that whole group, these models don't describe how they're voting, then maybe we need to start questioning whether these models are really the right models and whether they're measuring the risk that we thought. To summarize it very simply, we just asked the question, do investors view um, the Fama French factors as outperformance or as risk? And the answer is they view it as outperformance, not mm. as risk. Right. And so it's an alpha. It's so they view it, they count it as alpha, not as not as a risk premium that you can because another way of saying it is a risk, you shouldn't reward a manager with more money if all they did was take more risk according to that risk premium. Right. That's not you, you should only reward them if it was outperformance. And so clearly they count it as outperformance. Now, in the beginning, there was some criticism and people said, oh, but this is just because it's uh, it's unsophisticated investors. But then there were some people that did it for hedge funds, where I think people generally agree that the investors are quite more sophisticated and they found the same result there. 
And then there were even some people that tried to do it for real investment decisions inside firms to figure out what firms themselves use as the risk model. And again, the same, no, I say that quite incorrectly, how firms decide to repurchase their stock or issue more stock. Mm. And so that's also an investment decision that is made inside the firm by managers. And again, the same result shows up. It's again going to be the CAPM. So, so the CAPM seems to be quite a dominant model that seems to be showing up all over the place. And if we were really fair with ourselves, I think if you ask the number of finance professors that in their core finance class taught anything but the CAPM, I think, don't think any of them really went to any of these multi-factor models. Mm. And that that is also revealed preference, right? Because if you really thought that this was the risk model that everybody should be using, why isn't it taught everywhere as the risk model that people should have? And then on top of that, the finance literature also votes with their feet because it wasn't the case that we all converged to the multi-factor models. What we started doing was we just report the results of the paper for five different risk models because nobody really wanted to take a stance on what it really was. You do it and for the CAPM and for the Fama French three and four and five factor <laughs> models plus the, I mean, so clearly I think we were we were just building this confusion there. And I've always found this disappointing because as an asset pricer, I always thought that we we were just given one job. And that is tell people how to adjust for risk. And if there's one job that we have not delivered on, it is to mm. tell people how we need to adjust for risk. So in that sense, as a field, I think we've largely failed so far. And so I think there's work to be done. Now, the CAPM works the best in terms of explaining investor behavior, but it doesn't work perfectly either. So so the, the, I think the best summary, Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the CAPM is the best we have so far. But I'm not sure it's the, it's the ultimate answer. But it's, uh, it's certainly the other things that we've tried may not be improvements. Yeah, you know, let me just add the following anecdote, which is I think when you write a good paper, when you do good research, you're surprised in some fundamental way. And if you ask me about that work, what fundamentally surprised me, it's the following. Before I started, if you'd said to me, OK, Jonathan, what's going to happen? I think I would have predicted um, what we're going to find is that is that investors use the market portfolio, Right that they benchmark against the market. But we didn't find that. We found that they the cap am worked. In other words, they're not benchmarking against the market. They're adjusting for beta because one of the other models we have in there is the market model. And it didn't perform as well as the capital asset pricing model. That in fact, the essence of the cap am, which is that you measure risk with the beta you understand fundamentally that idiosyncratic risk can be diversified away. And all you care about systematic risk absolutely was verified in this research. And that came as a big surprise to me, especially given the inability of the model to explain the cross-section of, of, of stock returns. And so that's what Jill said. There's something missing, no question about it. We have a field have failed to adjust to fully explain risk models. But having said, having said that, Bill Sharp's capital asset pricing model is the best we have. And there is a lot of substance there. And if you were going to, and when I teach it, that's what I tell students to do. Look, we don't have the answer, but it's not like we know nothing. The best we have is the capital asset pricing model. It imposes a lot of discipline and it's what you should use when you're trying to make a corporate financing decision. <laughs> Wow, this has been an incredible discussion. And we have one final question for each of you. How do you each define success in your lives? Jonathan, you want to go first? <laughs> we, the, two of us have, the two of us have talked about this a lot. And so uh, how we're supposed to be defined. Ask a 60-year-old man is such a question because, you know, I think, I think one of the sad issues of all of us, and I tell my students this all the time, is uh, look down, not up, right? We're all very competitive people, very successful people. And we're always looking, uh, you know, whenever we achieve success, we go, oh my God, that's not enough, right? And I tell my students, no, if you want to be happy, look down, not up. Look at what you've achieved, not what you could have achieved. So I think the best definition of, of success is uh, to, to, to really appreciate what you have done in life. And I don't mean just, okay, great, I admit that I'm immensely proud 
of some of the research that I've done. It, it, you know, astonishing to me that I could do stuff that that could actually inform people. But there are other things. I don't, I don't want to sound soppy about this. I can't stand it when people say, you know, sound soppy. But realistically, there are other parts of your life that are important. You know, how successful are you as a parent? You know, how successful are you in other areas of your life? And I think success should be what have I achieved and, you know, what could I have possibly thought about when I was young? You know, as I like to say to Jules, here I sit. I'm, Jules knows I'm always complaining. But, you know, if you'd said to me, when I was growing up in my house in South Africa, that one day I would be on the faculty at one of the world's greatest universities at the time when one of my colleagues won the Nobel Prize, I would have said you were dreaming. You were absolutely dreaming that I could never in a world achieve that level of success. And yet, you know, here I am in exactly that position complaining about I'm not successful enough. So one piece of advice, look down not up. Jules? Yeah, so I, I I mean, the more the more I see what's happening in society today, the more I'm and I, therefore I think I've chosen the right profession in the sense that I think our biggest job is to pass on to the next generations, the collective body of knowledge that we have accumulated. And I, and I think that if you look at certain cultures and certain events, world events and historical events, losing that passing on is, is not so hard. I mean, it only requires a generation or a generation or two to not pass on the, the culture, the education, the, the drive, the value system that we have in terms of how we treat other people, that we treat other people like individuals, for example, and not as members of groups. I mean, and we were really struggling with that right now. And so I think that, um, and, and there I think being a parent comes in a lot too, but also I think being a teacher and, 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 and being able to justify in, in some of the recent classes that I've developed and started teaching, I wanted to communicate much better why as a field and uh, of economics and finance, we arrived at what we do today to begin with, right? So in other words, when the Wharton students come here, we can teach them the formula of the cap M. And then they can go home with that, not with that formula and apply it or not apply it. But I haven't taught them really how to critically think. I haven't really taught them what the underlying philosophy is of why markets are competitive and what the benefits of competitive markets are and why the expected return on investment is only a function of its risk and not of other things, which is very much a consequence of these competitive markets. And so the underlying philosophy uh, and the, the, a lot of the enlightenment values that we've been taught, I think I think bringing those back into the classroom, I think is, uh, is that. And so if you ask me, how do you define success? The more of that I can pass on to next generations uh, in whatever form, I think that's how that's how I would define it. So, uh, so in that sense, I think our teaching mission is just as important at this point as our research mission. Uh, great, great answers, and thanks, guys, for joining us. This has been so much fun, so enlightening, and hopefully, you'll come back one day. This has been great. Thank you so much Thank for inviting us. Thank you for inviting us, and we, I really enjoyed this. Okay, awesome. I've got to go. I actually have to go to. I have to go and teach. All right, guys. All right. Bye. Thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Bye. Guys. Thanks Stay a lot. Much. Thank you.